days. Thank you all for being here. Uh, certainly, I think the topic at hand is one that is of great interest to a number of folks, and uh, it's something we're quite excited about as well and look forward to uh, discussing. Uh, I want to let you know that I'll kind of generally outline what it is uh, that we are doing, uh, what is going to take place starting today as it relates to uh, the Medicaid waiver that we are going to make public for public consumption and uh, involvement and feedback starting today, what kind of led to this, uh, generally the outline of it, and then specific questions that you have, uh, we'll be happy to take. Much of the detail behind this uh, has really been as a result of the tremendous work of the individuals that are standing uh, with me here today. I want to give a, a personal uh, and sincere thank you uh, to the University of Kentucky and their health care system specifically for lending to us uh, Mark Birdwhistle, who's over my uh, left shoulder here. Mark is, we could not have done this without him. He's a man with an amazing amount of expertise and knowledge. The others here as well, Secretary Glisson, the rest of this team, this is a group of people uh, who have worked tirelessly uh, with CMS, uh, with the Health and Human Services in Washington, D.C., CMS specifically that oversees Medicaid and Medicare, to come up with what is going to be truly a transformative uh, and sustainable uh, and fantastic program. As a reminder to some of you, I, this is very personal to me in many respects. I grew up in a home with no health care of any kind. I had no health care insurance uh, of any kind until I was in my 20s. I was an active duty Army officer uh, before I ever had access to the health care system. And so there were, you know, things that didn't get stitched up in torn meniscuses that you hobbled around on crutches for a few months because you couldn't afford to have it taken care of. And so for me, this was very personal as we entered into this. This was something I wanted to see us take very seriously. And yet at the same time, too, it's important to make sure that we have something that actually, above all else, does what? Creates better health outcomes. We can provide all the lip gloss we want and all the encouragement uh, to do something without actually doing anything and make ourselves falsely feel good. I wasn't looking for that in any way, shape, or form. So I want you to know that over the course of the last three, six, nine months, really, this started early on as people began to strategize, but in the last six months in particular since we came in with this administration, we have had repeat multiple uh, conversations with the people at uh, CMS. We, in fact, have met with them multiple times in person. Uh, I've had personal conversations uh, many times, face-to-face -face and over the phone, with uh, Secretary Burwell, who is the Secretary uh, for Health and Human Services, uh, even yesterday uh, we spoke yet again talking about some of the things we're going to lay out for you today. This has been a good open dialogue. It's been in good faith. I'm encouraged by that. This is the kind of thing that makes me confident that they will, in fact, support the waiver that we are requesting. This is an 1115 waiver. You're all familiar with that term. Some of you may or may not know exactly what that means. But in essence, any application of Medicaid dollars in any state come in the form of some type of waiver program. And there's a many iterations of them. But we are asking for one that will really help to transform us and focuses on three distinct things. And some of the reasons for this, I just want to share with you just some of the facts that, sadly, I wish were not the case, and some of you have heard these, but just to kind of reiterate, one out of three people in Kentucky are obese, are, are suffering from or at risk of diabetes. That's a sobering statistic. We're number two in the nation uh, in terms of uh, lung cancer. We're number one in the nation in cancer deaths. We are fourth highest in cardiovascular mortality in the United States. Drug addiction were the third highest number of overdose dose, dose deaths in the United States. You think about this. I mean, in terms of risk for uh, hep C, you know, 220 at-risk counties in the nation, 54 of them, 54 of them are in Kentucky. These are sobering facts. These are things that informed our conversation. This is part of why we were as serious as we were and have spent the amount of time that we have spent with the people at CMS to come up with something that truly transforms health for people in Kentucky. 
Again, we're not looking for the perception that we're doing something well. We want good health outcomes. So the number one goal, and the one thing about this, we're calling this Kentucky Health. And like any good program, there's an acronym. But the acronym for uh, Kentucky Health is, let me find me, and I honestly want to make sure I don't uh, misread it here. The, uh, Mark, you might have to help me out here for the, uh, what the, the health stands for, helping... Tell me out. Help okay. Me. Helping to engage. Yes. There we go. And achieve long-term health. Thank you. Helping to engage and achieve long-term health. And that's the acronym itself. But truth be told, you know, the word itself speaks for itself. And what we want for people is three primary things. We want to create better health outcomes. Number two, we want to familiarize participants with the commercial insurance program and the way it works because the intent of this is not to create a trap for people. It's not to create a dead end for people. It's to create opportunity. It's to come alongside and help people because ultimately we want people to be on private health insurance because they're working, because they're involved in their communities and they are engaged as employees of companies where this is available to them. So that we want better health outcomes. We want people to be familiarized with being engaged in their communities and ultimately being familiar with the commercial uh, health insurance arena. And, and thirdly and critically, as we've said, we want to make sure that this has long-term sustainability. Some of the things that have gone on over the course of the last six months is that we have had in incredible levels of conversation with the people who are provide the MCOs in Kentucky. There are five of them that Secretary Glisson and her team have been working with. Just the renegotiation of those MCO contracts alone will, over the course of the next six months, generate in savings to the taxpayers, federal and state, $260 million. $280 million, I stand corrected, 26 of which is state dollars, but $280 million over the course of the next six months alone. And you think about that. That's just simply by being more efficient in the application process itself. If we can apply some of those same kind of thinkings to this transformation, which is what we're looking to do, the benefits will be fantastic. We'll have more people with better access better health outcomes, and ultimately, because of that, it saves money. The point wasn't to start trying to save the money. It was a recognition of the fact that you have healthier people who are more regularly being taken care of from a health care standpoint. They're going to be healthier. That's the reality of it. And that health is going to result in savings. And so over the course of the next five years, if the waiver that we are asking for is approved by CMS, it will result in savings of $2.2 billion to the taxpayers of America. We are heavily subsidized by federal dollars. You're aware of that in our Medicaid program. But it would be $1.9 billion in federal dollars, 300 and some million dollars in savings to what is budgeted for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And we're seeing some glimpse of that, as I said, just based on renegotiation of contracts with our MCOs. This has been the most lucrative state in America for MCOs to operate. That will be less the case uh, as we move forward, thanks to the work that has been done. The, the profit rate in Kentucky is literally four to five times the national average for MCOs. That will also be changing. The net result of that is that those dollars are available to be used to the benefit of our citizens. And so we are asking CMS for their approval of the 1115 waiver that we will be putting out today. It is one that expects a level of participation and engagement. It is one that is sustainable. It is one that is ultimately financially viable, not only in the near term, but in the long term. One that will transform health care in this state. And I think ultimately because of some of the things we're doing, one of which I'll touch on in just a moment. It has the ability to transform the way in which health care is applied nationally as well, through the Medicaid program specifically. Whether or not this is accepted is entirely at the uh, discretion of CMS. The federal government, through Health and Human Services, CMS specifically, Secretary Burwell and her team, 
will decide whether there will be expanded Medicaid in the state of Kentucky. It's as simple as that. The Commonwealth's expansion of Medicaid is now going to lie in the hands of CMS. It is potential. We are excited by that potential. We will be better off for it. But the approval of it will be at their hands, and we will know over the course of the next days. What you will see, because this will be released on the, health, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services website as this concludes, this entire waiver request will be put out on that website. I encourage you to go and look at it and read it. You will see there are various stakeholders in this room, frankly, and others who are not here today, who have weighed in. in the, we've seen comments. We've heard from people. We've had conversations with people. We've received things in writing. And you will see many of the thoughts and, and ideas that you had reflected in this proposal that we have put out there. And so already you have seen your, your voices and, and words being taken into consideration. And this is what we have had dialogue with CMS about. So we're excited about this. I personally am because, again, it's, it's somewhat personal to me. I want to see us become a healthier state. I don't want us simply to provide people with a Medicaid card and feel like we've done our part. We owe people better than that. We hope we owe them better health outcomes. We owe it to them as a result of the fact that they have access and can afford that access. That's how you get better health outcomes. And so to reiterate, finally, I think God is weighing in on this and agrees with everything I just said. The last thing really, again, improving the health outcomes, making sure that we, through this program, create a model that allows people to not be trapped by this, but to be empowered by this, to use this assistance to find ways to even better assimilate into the private health care marketplace. And number three, to in so doing, create a sustainable model. Better health outcomes, better engagement by the participants, and better sustainability for the long term. So I've spoken broadly the exact details. We can drill into some based on questions that you may have. This will be a 30-day period that it will be posted. There will be several different periods of conversation that will occur. The first 30-day period begins today. And this will, again, be posted out there. We will be looking for feedback from any and all uh, parties that are interested. Uh, that conversation will go on, as will our continued conversations with CMS. What questions can we answer for any of you? All right. Excellent. What questions can we address? For any of you? I'm going to, for the details, this is, this is a good question, and, and I'm going to ask Mark to give you the details on this. We've had a lot of back and forth on different things, and so what we are looking for is engagement. The specifics of that I'm going to let Mark speak to uh, as the architect of this uh, to give you the, the details on what you'll see when you look at this tonight. Well, thank you, Governor, and the simple answer is yes. Uh, we will be uh, imposing pre premiums on the, the people covered in the waiver. Uh, we heard loud and clear from the advocacy community that uh, they prefer premiums versus co-pays. So for people both all the way from 34% of poverty up to 138% of poverty, there will be premiums. Now these premiums will be fixed dollar amounts ranging between a dollar up to $15. If they pay their premiums, then they don't have to pay the co-pays. We are patterning the benefits after the state employee health insurance benefits. So there are some benefits that are not covered, most notably dental and vision, which will not be covered initially. There will be a rewards account through which members will be encouraged to engage in their own health activities and be able to earn credit through which they can buy back their own dental and vision coverage. Simply by taking a health risk assessment or participating in volunteer work, they'll be able to get uh, credit that they can use to buy additional benefits. Uh, basically, it applies to the able-bodied adults. Everything we're talking about today does not relate to the frail, elderly, 
and the individuals with d disability that are covered under other waivers. Are the eligibility you know? requirements changing at all? Pardon me? Are the eligibility requirements No. Mark, as you know, Kentucky has some of the worst dental health in the nation. Do you think it's wise to remove that benefit uh, under this plan right now? As I say, Debbie, they'll be able to get it back fairly readily by engaging in their own health care. We're asking that members be engaged in their community. We're asking them to be engaged in their own health care. Uh, we feel very confident by doing a few activities, they will be able to regain those benefits if it's one that they choose. Will anybody lose their health insurance? Anybody that's covered under Medicaid uh, has the opportunity to continue coverage. Now, our philosophy has been that this is a transitional coverage. Um, I've been saying this in other meetings that we're looking at this as commercial insurance on training wheels. So everything has a look and feel of commercial insurance. So it, as people are successful in that endeavor and they move forward, and are successful in obtaining commercial coverage, yes, they will roll off the program. But that's the goal. This is a demonstration waiver. So that's what we're hoping to demonstrate and look forward to CMS approval of that. If, just like in commercial insurance, if individuals do not pay premiums, I dealt with a lady on Medicare Part D this week at my church that had not paid her Medicare Part D premium. So she had to suffer the consequences of that. We didn't feel like that was totally appropriate. So there will be a lockout period if they do not pay their premiums, but we're giving them a chance, we call those on-ramps, that they have the ability to come back on if they do a health, health literacy class, class and pay um, all of their premiums that are in arrears. So they have an on-ramp back on. Here again, it's another, it's another teaching opportunity. Based on the other states that they have done this, uh, they have automated this to a major extent. Uh, but we think it's very important, even if somebody is contributing a dollar, that they be involved in the purchase of their health care so they can understand what's happening. So there's a dollar, four dollars, six dollars, eight dollars, up to fifteen dollars is the max. Now, if they don't approve, if they, after they've been on the program for two years, there is the opportunity that those premiums will go up but that's only applicable to people over 100% of poverty. It's not about the premiums. It's not about it's it's not about the money from it's not about the money for the premiums. It's about the learning experience. Exactly. This is this is an important piece to understand. For those who want so badly for this to be purely about dollars, you're completely misunderstanding the purpose behind this. We are trying to create a program whereby we will have healthier people who have more responsibility. There is nothing in this 1115 waiver, nothing that we are asking for, that the federal government on its very own website, for people, some of whom are disabled, say that they are seeking. They are looking for engagement. There is encouragement, for example, for people to take ownership. And the reason for this because there is no price on what I'm about to say, and therefore the dollars and cents are not what should be the focus. Whether it, what it costs us to get a dollar, do we really think that one and two and four dollar copays are going to pay for the program? Of course not, of course not. The savings come from having people who are healthier, who are more engaged, who are less recidivizing, if that's the right word, as it relates to health care needs, who are becoming mainstreamed into the commercial world because they're working and engaged. That's where the savings is. It is the opportunity cost of not providing people the dignity and the respect that come from being able to do for themselves. 
the opportunity cost far exceeds the cost of implementing this program. It will actually deliver less dollars to the state if we were to take one and two and four dollar co or, uh, premium payments as opposed to co-pays. Right now, the participants pay more money through the existing co-pay program than they would if they opted to pay the premium. Simply paying a one dollar premium, and I want to reiterate something. Every single one of these individuals, based on a question that was asked earlier, will have the exact same health care coverage that every single state employee has. And that, for those of you who happen to be state employees or understand, is one of the more robust and generous health care programs in the state of Kentucky, private or public. It is a very generous and appropriate program. Every one of these individuals will have access to the exact same degree of health care. But it isn't about trying to save money. The money will come by doing the right thing. That, were, that is clear. Better, healthier outcomes result in cost savings on health expenditures. That's the reality. But the savings are the, are the cart. The horse is doing the right thing. Governor, if the CMS does not approve this money, are you saying that you will appeal the expanded Medicaid program? They will make that decision. If they do not approve this, there will not be expanded Medicaid in the state of Kentucky. That's correct. Their, their decision will determine whether there is expanded Medicaid in this state. CMS's decision. It's up to CMS. You had a question. I'm sorry? They understand. And they understand. And this is why, again, when you look at this waiver request, everything in it is something, for example, the community engagement. We're asking able-bodied, working-aged men and women to be as engaged as Health and Human Services says on its own website that we want the disabled population to be, to provide opportunities for people to volunteer and or work and be engaged in their communities. We want the same types of things. So we want to create an environment where people are incented to become a part of their own health care solution. We're going to start this with a pilot program. We're not going to roll this out statewide. What we're asking for in this waiver uh, is the ability uh, to basically choose several counties where we think we can have the greatest impact. And we'll start small. There'll be a pilot program, and we will ultimately roll this out to increasing numbers of counties, and ultimately the intent would be to the entire state. What gives us an idea of a timeline when this application was filed, will be filed, and when do you think it will roll out? Sure. I mean, I'm going to defer back to Mark, but it's being rolled out literally as we speak. It'll be posted to the website uh, as soon as this press conference is over. Uh, there will be a 30-day initial period of public discourse, and then there will be several follow-ons to that. Simultaneously, we will continue to be, as we have been in discussions with CMS, the summation of that and the final determination. What are we expecting now in terms of time frame? There's how many of these sessions? Two? Okay. We will start by um, posting the waiver today. That begins the initial 30-day period. We will receive comments at public hearings, which are posted on the, on the material. Uh, as a result of that, we will take that into consideration, finalize the waiver. The waiver will be then formally submitted to CMS. They, again, will do a 30-day comment period. We're anticipating that we would submit our waiver on or about August 1 that we think that taking into consideration the 30-day period that they have, plus negotiations, we would like to have approval of this waiver by September 30th is our goal. So you have yet to file the waiver with the federal government's funding? That is, that is correct. Today, we're posting it for Kentucky. Okay. Today is ta the time for Kentuckians to weigh in. We'll take those into consideration after 30 days plus the consideration of the comments, we will post, we will formally submit the waiver to CMS, which I'm pr projecting to be around August 1. Mark, can you describe some more about this uh, incentive program and how that works? Okay, good question. We're envisioning what we're calling my rewards account. Every, every person involved in the program will have a my rewards account through which they will have the opportunity to earn, I call it credits, by doing health risk assessments, participating in a disease management program, uh, volunteering at a nursing home, taking a literacy class, 
taking a class at a community college or work, and by doing so, they will earn credits that they will be able to subsequently apply to add additional benefits, dental, vision, gym membership, other over-the-counter medications, other healthcare related things that are not covered by the plan. Including anti smoking programs? Yes. If you participated in a smoking cessation program, good example, uh, you would have credits earned to your My Rewards account. If HHS has no problem with most of this, like 80 and 90 percent, but not with 100 percent of it, would that be acceptable or would you? That's part of the negotiation process. That's literally, that is the purpose. These timelines that are being laid out, we didn't just arbitrarily choose them. There is a process whereby these things unfold to include the public uh, comment period and then the negotiation with CMS. I do want to make clear and to reiterate, this has been going on for six months. The degree of conversation, there is nothing in this that they will see. The question was, when is it being posted? It is being posted today. There is nothing in this that is going to be a surprise to them. There is nothing that we have not talked to them about. In fact, I will be very frank about it. There are many things not in here that I would have liked to have seen, that others who have worked on this from our side would have liked to have seen. But in fairness to the conversation that has occurred, we have come to what is a very manageable, doable uh, approach. We have a waiver that we are proposing that is absolutely, it's, it's, there's nothing we're asking them to do that has not been done or is not a stated goal of theirs in other programs. And so we have ultimately come to something that we think is best for all parties concerned. One of the things that, frankly, I'm grateful for as well is that as a part of all this, we have the opportunity to include a, a drug addiction, an opiate specifically related uh, program using Medicaid dollars that has never been done in the United States. And CMS and HHS has for quite some time been trying to find a pilot program, trying to find a state that is willing to pioneer this willing to lead on this. And I personally have seen the, the scourge as it has affected people, and it's heartbreaking. And we as a state owe it to our citizens, and frankly, America owes it to its citizens to get our arms around this drug epidemic. This waiver will be part of what's included in here is the ability to address that in a way using dollars that are for health care purposes that has never been done in the United States. I mean, the specifics, Mark, do you want to speak to that? I mean, it's fairly, or Vicki, if you'd like to, yes. Thank you. This, this program, this substance use disorder program, allows us to make sure that we keep in place all mental health benefits that are currently uh, offered. It also allows us to increase access to actually expand some of the SUD benefits. So we're going to be able to act, uh, increase access to IMDs. These are Institutes for Mental Disease. It also allows us then to kind of work with our existing entities that are out there in the state to be able to uh, offer best practices and standards of care and to coordinate the care. So importantly, this pilot project allows us to address the drug issue that we have, the drug addi addiction issue we have in the state that the governor talked about. Uh, it also allows us to take into consideration some of our chronic diseases and to incorporate that into now a pilot project that we are going to be looking at certain counties to be able to roll that out. As the governor mentioned, there are 200, over 200 counties in the country that are looking at high risk uh, that are associated with drug addiction. We have 54 of those in Kentucky, so we were going to be looking at, into those 54 counties and offering this pilot project there. When you say increased access to does that mean more beds? Yes. IMD, IMDs are institutes that historically, folks that are between uh, 21 and 64, they were not able, if you were going into a drug addiction program, they would not be offered up as, a, as an option. Medicaid did not pay for those, those institutes. They would have more than, if they had more than 16 beds, and if you were between 21 and 64, you would not be able to access those particular facilities. We're asking to waive that limitation, and so now folks that have been licensed as IMDs, that you'll be able to go into those programs for at least a 30-day residential drug treatment program. So it expands that benefit. I think it will be very helpful for Kentucky. Is there any aspect of this that expands uh, access to ability to people on Medicaid to have medication-assisted treatment for opioid dependence? Well, we already provide that in the Medicaid program. I assume that, that will be, we will be looking into that. The medication piece is an important component of that, and we're going to be looking into that, yes. 
No, we're looking, we have 54 counties that we're gonna start with that we're gonna be looking into. We're not sure how many of those counties will be included, uh, but those are our priority right now just because we know that we have such a high risk, both of drug addiction and we also know that we have other diseases like hep C and HIV that are prevalent in those counties or potentially prevalent because of the drug addiction issue. But no determination has been made yet. Right now, it's a statewide, this is a statewide waiver. We're just, uh, we're looking, the 1115 is a statewide waiver. This is a particular pilot project that's going to be offered within that waiver. No. It was an opportunity that we could offer that. There's elements, there are elements of this 1115, specifically the opioid and other certain sub-elements that will be rolled out on a pilot basis. But overall, the 1115, that is a good point, and I may have you know, not been clear enough at the outset. What we're asking for approval on, this 1115 will cover Medicaid as it relates to the entire Commonwealth and to our entire current Medicaid population. One thing that's important, and to your point, Debbie, I mean, one thing that's important is the purpose of this public uh, conversation that will occur over the next 30 days. We want input. Those counties, we know what the 54 most at-risk counties are. We could guess as to which among them are probably the most likely. But to surmise that at this point, I think, would be a mistake. We want to hear from people who are on the ground in those communities who are saying it needs to be here. That is the point of this conversation. We want this kind of dialogue and feedback from the, feedback from the various uh, stakeholders uh, in, in health care. Correct. If, 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 in fact, it is approved, and that's what we're asking for, and that's what we expect. Sure. There's a lot of moving parts. This is a very complex and costly program. I think if you're looking for broad themes, one thing that I would have you take away from you, from, from here, is, is the following. For those who came either hoping for or against the fact that we are kicking people off of health care, quite the opposite. The intent is to make this as available to everybody as it has been, to make the program more successful by making it more accountable by restoring a sense of dignity that comes with people having some stake in their own health outcomes. This, this rewards program is a perfect example. It's some equivalent of, like, and some of you may have some appreciation for an FSA, except the difference is, or an HSA, you're putting your own dollars into like an FSA. Here you have the ability to earn tax dollars to your own benefit. The broad theme is this. We want people in Kentucky to be healthier. We want to give them the access, we want to give them the dignity, we want to give them the ownership, and we want to make it sustainable. The net result of those things will make it more affordable for everybody, which means we'll have that much more to do that much more. We want more people in Kentucky healthier because they have access and because it's affordable. That's what we're looking for, that's all we're asking for. And there is nothing in the waiver that we are submitting that you will see and that they will see that has not been approved and or is not the stated goal of our federal government right now as it relates to the use of these Medicaid dollars. That's important to understand. We're not asking for people to jump outside the box on anything. And we are confident that when this is approved by them, because it's entirely in their hands, if in fact it is improved, not only will we have the same expanded Medicaid population, but ultimately we will have fewer people. Because guess what? We're going to have better outcomes. And more of these people will then be engaged to degrees where they will now to take ownership and be part of the commercial environment so that they won't be as dependent on federal and state dollars for their health care. How will this plan move people to private plans? How do you envision that? Again, if you are engaged, let's say you want to earn my rewards programs. And so you start volunteering. You're volunteering and or you're working and or, you know, you're doing things in your community. It's interesting, if you go to the federal government's website and you look at how it is that they encourage those who are disabled, physically disabled, to get engaged in their communities, we are incentivizing and encouraging the individuals and the employers to find ways to help people to assimilate. Why is that? 
Is it because they're bored? No, it's because there's something valuable that comes from being an engaged part of your community. If a person is physically disabled and they are shut up in their home and they are not engaged in any way, shape or form in their community, it is not good for their physical health. It is not good for their mental health. It's not good for them. It's not good for society that loses out on their participation. That is the stated mission and purpose and goal for those in our society who are physically disabled. Why should we demand anything less for those who are not physically disabled? Working aged, able-bodied men and women, why should we not create an environment in which they are equally or even more incented? We're just saying equally incented. And so in this waiver, we're asking the federal government to allow us to expect of able-bodied people the very same thing they, the federal government, has given the mandate to us to provide to disabled people. There is nothing good or healthy or productive long-term for the individual or society as a whole that comes from able-bodied working age men and women with no expectation of their involvement and no opportunity for that involvement. So we are providing an expectation and an opportunity and a reward. And so how will they get into the commercial world? Because many of these people have amazing intellect and ability and drive and ability to add value. And when they start to get out there, maybe it's because they're volunteering five hours a week at a local nursing home, or maybe because they take a, a job helping out at a food pantry, or who knows what. Maybe they find that they're repairing computers. I don't, it could be any number of things. But when they get out there and they get engaged and they start to realize the value that they add, it will change people's lives. And they will say, you know what? I should be doing this not five hours a month. I should be doing it 50 hours a week. I should do it as much as I possibly, whatever they want to do. We want people to take ownership because there is dignity that comes from that. And we are robbing too many people of the ability to do for themselves. We owe them that. It's a, it's a good comment, and the reality is, for those that didn't hear the question, is what do you say to the fact that this is in the hands of the federal government, and a lot of people don't trust the federal government has historically or may in the future make the best possible health care outcome decisions for participants or any other decision? I don't necessarily disagree with you. We don't necessarily, at the federal government level, have the most efficient track record of spending dollars wisely, but that is the way the system works. If I had the ability at the state level to simply implement this 1115 waiver, it would be done. It is not my call. Unfortunately, the way the system works is we spend, uh, we, we, the taxpayers, send our dollars to Washington. And then with their rules attached, we get some of them back. That's the way the system works. I think a lot of people do think that's inappropriate, but that's sadly the way it works. No, it's, the, it's entirely the decision of the federal government. Entirely. You understand, the federal, most of the dollars for this come from the federal government. I can't make them give us money. I don't have that ability. I really don't. No, again, th there's many things that will come from this process. I can't guess as to what they'll be. We'll start with this public discussion. We'll start then with negotiation with the uh, CMS based on the waiver itself, the request itself, the feedback itself, the conversations with them. And this will be a process that will unfold. Ultimately, the ball does lie in their court. I wish it did not to the same degree that it does, but it does. That's the way it works, not only on this program, but any number of others as well. Sure. Yeah, Mark or Vicky. That's a very good point. Yes. Yeah, glad you asked that, and then I've got a follow-up to you. Um, one of the benefits that we're going to be asking that the federal government say that we do not have to require, the state employee health insurance plan does not pay for non-emergency transportation. That is a traditional Medicaid-type service and much needed. Uh, we're going to be asking that, that not be a required service 
since it's not in our benchmark plan, the state employee health plan. That is there currently. Uh, we are finding, based upon statistics, that a very small number of individuals have used it. That being said, people that have disabilities or have, that are frail or elderly or have some condition, we will make sure that they get transportation. But we're not going to, we're going to ask permission to not make that a standard benefit for able-bodied able workers. We will take everything, uh, all of the comments and feedback into consideration. Let me go back to your point. One of the things that we have failed, I've got my little checklist here and I wanna make sure we cover everything. Uh, in order to, one of the things about getting people onto commercial health insurance. One of the key features of this program is that many people that are currently covered by Medicaid today are employees of large institutions that have employer-based insurance. One of the things we're asking for is a requirement that after being on the program for one year, if individuals have the opportunity to tap into an employer-based coverage, they will be required to enroll in that employer-based coverage. If there are services that are not covered under that employee plan, employer plan, there will be a wraparound benefit to ensure nobody loses. That will get people into commercial coverage, we think, faster than anything we've got. It will be an incentive to employers as well. I mean, talk about that and the logic behind this. I think. And just to clarify, folks will apply for this to the federal website, and that's just going to work, right? They will apply through no. No, it's still good. This is totally different. Yeah, this totally. is totally different. This is a large employer that's no, not. About that, about but let's finish that them. point. Let's finish this point, and then and then we'll come to your question. Yeah, I'll turn that one to the others. So you got you have my point that if it's a large employer that has commercial health insurance, self-insured or otherwise, after being on the program for a year, individuals will be required to get in that and also bring their children with them. Because if we think there's value of having the, uh, the parents and the children all in one insurance home. No, again, I mean, the, the key is so that an employer uh, understands that by enrolling a person who might otherwise not want to enroll in their program, Having more workers, interestingly, if you have more participants as an employer, if you have more people in your plan, it becomes more affordable. So you want more people just because you're spreading risk, you're part of a broader risk pool. So an employer, is, let's say they have some lower paid employees, but they do offer some basic level health care coverage to those folks. If somebody who is a worker, again, what is the purpose of Expand and Medicaid? It is intended to provide working people an opportunity to have access to health care. That was the point of it. We agree that we want that to be available. So if you are such a person and you're working in a company that offers some base level health care, but you get better health care by not using that, we want them to have the ability to and the encouragement to become a part of their employer's plan. It makes them more connected with their employer. It helps their employee, the employer to be able to have a better program with more participants that they can then ultimately offer better services. But to that individual who would, if doing so, lose something relative to what they're getting in Medicaid, we will provide that wraparound and ensure they get, ironically, they'll get better coverage than the other people they work with. But... We're not paying the employer. No, we're not the employer. No, other than to do the right thing. And I'll tell you this, and you all know this. If you're somebody who works, for any of you who've worked in the private sector, you know, if you work at a company, if you're an employer, you want people that are engaged. People who sign up for benefits, people that are participating in a 401k plan, people who are engaged in that kind of a way are people who are invested in the, they're not thinking, I'm out of here in next week. These are people who pour in. The benefit to the employer is you get a more stable workforce. 
And that's an important thing to understand. Again, these are intangibles in some measure. They're, they're, it's more, it goes back to the question that you had about cost versus opportunity cost. There are tremendous benefits that come from people being engaged and being in a stable environment and taking ownership. There really is, and in ways that we'll be able to measure in the future based on things we can't even anticipate now. We'll, we'll wrap up with this, and this is a good point, and, and again, we're sort of, I've just been told we're somewhat over time here, so I apologize. Thank you for those of you who've stayed uh, through this. Let me come back to specifics. I want to say one quick point, and then I'll ask Mark to talk about some of the details. It isn't just self-reporting. They're very specific things that will have to be done, one of which I want to re reiterate that was touched on. That one of the things that will be able to be done for people to get these extra dollars and these rewards is taking a financial literacy course. I think we mentioned it as a literacy course. This is financial literacy. This is something that, frankly, we should require of everybody in Kentucky. I mean, very few people seemingly nowadays have the sense of understanding of the impact, the cost-benefit analysis of things. And so things like that that, frankly, benefit them far above and beyond their immediate health care impact, those are the types of things because we want better outcomes and better results for people. With respect to the ways in which it's reported and the, and the means through which that is done, Mark, if you want to briefly touch on that as to what we are proposing uh, at this time. Actually, there's just a, a very simple answer to that. We will have a vendor that is responsible for keeping track of that when people report it, which will tie into the eligibility system. So there will be accountability. It won't just be, um, it don't, won't be word of mouth. Also, there will be some linkages to uh, some of our training facilities, which we will get feeds from that. So we're going to build some accountabilities into the system managed by a vendor to tie into the eligibility. Well, actually, this is ultimately Medicaid's responsibility, but then there will be linkages to other cabinets. Uh, we've already had significant conversations with other cabinets, workforce, and others on how we can partner if individuals are participating in these things. Mark, Thank you. Governor, how confident are you that CMS will approve what you want to do? I can't. I mean, if I had that kind of crystal ball, I would be... Uh, able to say a lot of things. I could tell you who our next president is going to be. The, uh, I, will, I will tell you this. Um, it's up to them. I, we've had good conversation. Here's what I know. Secretary Burwell is a good person. She wants to see a successful outcome. We literally reaffirmed that in our conversation yesterday. We've met in person multiple times. We've had even more conversations. Our teams have talked multiple times a week for months, back and forth, back and forth. We've had meetings with them in their offices. They've been here. We've had a lot of good dialogue. Like then, I am confident, but again, I'm not, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I believe that I know they could do this. I know that we're asking for nothing that has not been done in other, other instances. I know there is no good reason not to do it. And so I am confident. I'm an optimist. And, as, and she said the same thing yesterday. We were kind of joking is that we're both happen to be glass half full type people. And so given that, I really feel good about the ability for this to come to fruition. I really do. And I'm excited about it. And let me end by saying two things, and then we'll wrap up. I want to briefly touch on Lawrence's question. The way in which people will sign up for this is the same way they're currently signing up for Medicaid benefits, the same way they always have. <clears throat> Before Connect, for example, we had 875,000 people on Medicaid in the state. They managed to get on it just fine. There isn't, Connect was just a, a, a website connection for people to be able to access it. They still have the ability through DCBS and other uh, offices and other online and in-person uh, on-ramps and programs. So that, that's not changing. It's the same way they're currently signing up. The, the thing I want to close with is this. This is a chance for Kentucky to lead in a way that is not in the statistics that I read to you at the outset. It's a way to address the, the levels of diabetes and drug addiction, the cardiovascular disease, the number of people dying of cancer deaths. It's a way to address these in a very head-on way. It's proactive. It's intentional. It's thoughtful. It's innovative. It's better than anything that's out there, I'll be honest. And the credit goes to Mark and this team behind me who have put a tremendous amount of work into making this happen. If, in fact, this comes into play, I am confident I can say this, I do have a great degree of confidence that we will have a healthier population. We will have more people with access to health care. It will be more accessible to them. It will be more affordable to them. 
The state will benefit from that. Our people will benefit from that. I'm excited by the possibility. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you all for being here, uh, and stay tuned. Thank you.